Welcome to the Grim Leftover Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. All right, folks. Hi. How the hell are y'all doing on this Monday, March 9, 2020? Yeah, it's a whole nother week rolled on by. We're in the episode 62 now of the Grim Leftover Show. Episode 62, here is the 10th show, 11th show, 10th show, 10th show of 2020. And I got some stuff lined up here for you. Hopefully you'll enjoy it all, uh, find it interesting, at least at a minimum. If not, it is what it is. I got what I got. It's what I, what I, what I put together for y'all. <laughs> anyway, let me say hi and howdy to all the folks out there and all the various places you may be tuned in from, whether that's right here on reallibertymedia.com, from either the Grim Leftovers show page or just right there on the sidebar. You got players right there. So uh, howdy to y'all there on reallibertymedia.com or those of you on rlmradio.xyz, because I know there's uh, some of you listening from that area of the interwebs as well. And welcome to those of you over there on freedomsnetwork.com and on realliberty.org. Yeah, a couple of our social networking partner sites. I guess that's the best way to put that, partner sites in those places. So welcome to all yous out there. And for those of you listening later on down the line on the podcasts, howdy, how you doing? Come on over to reallibertymedia.com sometime. Say hi to the people over here in the chat room, because we got a great chat room over here at reallibertymedia.com. It's actually, it's on freenode, irc.freenode.net, but uh, you can get there that way, or you can come right, come right on over to reallibertymedia.com and uh, pop up the chat there and start talking to all these great folks that we got here with us today and most every other day. Uh, that's right, we got, we got bots and we got bodies. We got them both. We got bots like Barman and bodies like Beetle and Cowboy Tech. And myself and the Mighty Moose Girl. Mighty Moose Girl we got Miss Kate. Yeah, baby. Um, <laughs> anti Chelsea Doty. Miss Donna Van Meter. Diam Van Meter. Duh, the duster. Uh, the neighbor of the moose. They're free enslaved and frumpy and jabber doctor. Meester, Meister, Mooster Brow, the woodman. Uh, Prince. Hey, Prince. How the heck you doing, man? I haven't talked to you too much lately. I know you're around. I see you popping in and out every now and then, but. Uh, I haven't really spoken with you. Mr. Robworks and the Mighty Bubla and all the fine things going on down there in Arkansas. Rome's, a.k.a. Trust No One. The Vanna White Bot, the Weather Dork Bot, Mr. Vin E. himself. Vin E., how you doing, brother? Are you feeling all right? Are things, are things going your way? Yeah, Vin E.'s had some interesting stuff going on in his world lately. We got the Phantom, Bruce Dickinson. Not spelled correctly as uh, Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden, but still, we got Bruce Dickinson in here. I, I had no idea. We got Joe Stewart and Cyborg Noodle. E-Man and Siv. A couple of people marked as guests. I think one of those is JJ's. Scotland boy. How you doing over there, JJ's? And I don't know who the other one might be, but uh, whoever you are, welcome to you as well. The Pwn Sauce in the Sock Puppet. Uh, smart ass. It's a smart ass bot. <laughs> Holiest of Rogers and Mr. Zivix. So all these great and wonderful folks here in the chat right now. Welcome to them, one and all. Yeah, I've been kind of slacking on uh, listing off people's names going into my shows, but uh, I did today. I did today. So all, all the folks in the chat, anyway. I didn't list all the folks on Freedoms Network or RealLiberty.org or any of those other uh, places. But, uh Okay. <laughs> we live in this world, this funny-ass world. And let me tell you, it's a funny-ass world. <laughs> and I, and I, I've been hearing little whispers of this term that's been kind of being floated around out there. And at this point in time, you probably haven't heard too much of it, but I guarantee you this is going to be a big thing. This is going to be a big phrase, and you're and you're going to, hear it and you're going to say, what, what, what the hell is that? But see, I and some others have been an expert at this for a long time, even though 
These morons just came up with this term, oh, about 14 years ago. <laughs> and when I say these morons, I'm talking about those over there at the CDC. And I think they came up with, it, with this phraseology. Uh, uh, and, you know, because I never called it that. It, it was never my purpose to go down this road, uh, uh, to go down this kind of uh, uh, terminology wording road. Uh, but but they did. They did because that's who they are. They're the CDC. And, and, and it cracked me up as I went to the CDC website. Uh, they call themselves the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And then they have a, a sub tagline there. CDC 24-7. Saving lives. Protecting people. Now, does anybody actually believe that the CDC has any interest or any desire or any goals towards saving lives or protecting people? <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> anyway, I came across this report. Well, I searched out the, the term, and then I came across this as a report as I was uh, looking for this term here. And, and it's filed under the research heading uh, on uh, November 2006. Uh Apparently, volume 12, number 11, there on the CDC website. Targeting social distancing designs for pandemic influenza. Social distancing. Social distancing. Bury that in your brain. Remember that phrase. Because, well, you won't have to for very long. It's going to become the main key phrase of all of the clap out there, the corporate lame-ass propaganda. They, this is going to be the thing that they're going to be aiming. And, and I, I personally love it. Uh, because to me, I mean, I've been practicing social distancing, although never called it that, for a long-ass time. Uh, basically, it means staying away from people. Staying away from other humans. I've, I've, I've recommended this practice to probably everybody I've ever talked to, well, at least in the last 20-odd years, uh, stay away from people. Humans are bad to be around. They're dirty. They're diseased. They're nasty. <laughs> Rob Works points out correctly, CDC is a for-profit vaccine company. That is exactly what they are. Well, it goes beyond vaccine, of course, but uh, that that is one of their main profit engines right there is the vaccine industry. Uh, but you can go throughout the whole pharma industry and, and the whole medical industrial complex uh, and see what the CDC is really all about. Uh, so anyway, so they put up this report here. Social distancing targeted, targeted the social distancing designs for pandemic influenza. Uh, Robert Glass, Laura Glass, related probably, uh, Walter Byler and... Uh, H. Jason Min. And interestingly enough, these were done, uh, apparently the uh, affiliations of these authors, Sandia National Laboratories, Albuquerque, uh, Albuquerque Public High School in Albuquerque, New Mexico, U.S. of A., uh, because that's where they did their studies at. <laughs> now, now, to give you the abstract of what they're talking about here, the abstract of the article, uh, research report targeted social distancing to mitigate pandemic influenza can be designed through a simulation of influenza spread within local community social contact networks social contact networks that means people you see on a regular basis social contacts they call them social contact networks we demonstrate this design for a stylized community representative of a small town in the United States. The critical importance for children and teenagers in transmission of influenza is first identified and targeted. For, for influenza as infectious as the 1957-58 Asian flu, around 50% infected, Closing schools and keeping children and teenagers at home reduced the attack rate by greater than 90%. For more infectious strains uh, or transmissions that is less focused on the young, 
adults and, and the work environment must also be targeted. Targeted! They're targeting you. Uh, tailored to specific communities across the world, such designs would yield local defenses against a highly virulent strain in the absence of vaccine and antiviral drugs. In the absence of vaccines and antiviral drugs. At the start of an influenza pandemic, effective vaccine and antiviral drugs may not be available to the general population, you lowlifes out there, you plebs. <laughs> if the accompanying illness and death rate of the virus strain are high, how might a community respond to protect itself? Closing roads, restricting travel, and community-level quarantine, self-quarantine, lock yourselves and your homes, will enter discussions. However, within a community, influenza spreads from person to person through the social contact network. Therefore, understanding and strategically controlling this network during a period of a pandemic is critical. Yes, critical. <laughs> uh, we, des we describe how social contact network-focused mitigation can be designed. At the foundation of the design process is a network-based simulation model for the spread of influenza. And you, you are nothing but a little icon. Maybe not even that. You might just be a pixel within their simulation. You are, you are a, a disease vector, and they need to figure out how to mitigate your effects on on this social contact network to prevent you from spreading whatever it is you you have or may get via your social contact network uh, to prevent you uh, from furthering uh, the well most most of the maps show that uh, people that are infected are in red so and and for to prevent you from spreading the red <laughs> Closing roads, restricting... Oh, I already read that part, didn't I? Well, I'm reading it again. Closing roads, restricting travel, and community-level quarantine will enter discussions. However, <laughs> anyway, therefore, understanding the strategically and strategically controlling this network during a period of pandemic is critical. Strategically controlling you. We describe how social contact network-focused mitigation can be designed. At the foundation of the design process is a network-based simulation model for the spread of influenza. Works just as well for corona, don't it? We apply this model to a community of 10,000 persons connected within an overlapping, stylized social network representative of a small United States town. After study of the unmitigated transmission of influenza within the community, we change the frequency of contact within the targeted groups and build combinations of strategies that can contain the epidemic. So they modify your behavior until it fits their model, which, according to them, based upon their model, uh, slows down, prevents, uh, puts a halt to the spread of whatever it is they're, they're uh, designing their model for. Finally, we show how ineffectivity of the strain and underlying structure, structure of the infectious contact network influences the, the, the design of social distancing strategies. Social distancing. In the absence of vaccine and antiviral drugs uh, designed for design for specific communities would defend against highly virulent influenza. They are going to design you. They're going to design your network. They're going to force you to behave in a way that fits their model. Not that their models are right or that any of these uh, pre-planned scientific models are ever right, 
Just look at the whole global warming nonsense if you want to see how badly flawed models are. Not only just do they put a model up there, they pump it with the data they want to be in there. Not the predicted actual outcome, but their, their, their desired outcome. That's how they do these things. Methods. The design process first creates an explicit social contact network in which persons... Persons, that's a legal term, by the way, are linked to others in a community. Spread of influenza within a network is then simulated by imposing behavioral rules. Behavioral rules. Imposing behavioral rules for persons, their links, and the disease. These rules are modified to implement targeted mitigation strategies within the community, the effectiveness of which is evaluated. The effectiveness within the model of which is evaluated. The contact network. The network is created by specifying groups of given sizes or range of sizes within which persons of specific ages interact like schools, uh, households, clubs. The average number of links per person within the group is also specified because cliques form or are imposed, seating in a classroom, stuff like that. Uh, this number uh, is used to construct with a within-group network, so groups within groups, that can take various forms. We use fully connected random or ring networks for each group. <laughs> random networks are formed by randomly choosing two persons within the group and linking them. This process is repeated until the number of links within the group yields the specified average. Each person will have a different number of links. The ring is formed by first placing persons next to neighbors and linking them to, com to form a complete circle. Some of this, you know, it may be a little dry, a little boring, a little, uh, and how do I care about this kind of stuff for, for non-data folk, but for data people. <laughs> Uh, if you're if you're a data person out there, raise your hand. Uh, anyway, <laughs> for data people, it's fascinating, uh, although flawed, highly flawed, but still fascinating. Additional links are then made to the next nearest neighbor symmetrically around the ring. Finally, links within the group are given an average frequency of contact per day. With this approach, a network can be built from the experience of community members to exhibit the clustered yet small world characteristics and overlapping quality of structured community. All right, let me just jump on down here to another part. <laughs> uh, behavioral rules. The spread of influenza within the contact network is modeled as a series of two classes of events, transitioned of a person between disease states and a person-to-person -person transmission of influenza. Disease state transition follows the natural history of influenza. After the latent state, an infected person transitions, transitions to an infectious pre-symptomatic state or an infectious asymptomatic state uh, with the probability PS1 or PS respectively. Um, uh, those with symptoms either stay home with probability PH. Uh, there's just some mathematical stuff going on here that you probably don't need to know about. Uh, thus influencing their contacts or continue to circulate with probability. Uh, infected asymptomatic persons continue interacting without behavioral changes because they're infected and they're able to, to, to spread the disease, but they don't yet know they have it. So they're interacting with other folks without uh, behavioral changes. Persons who are symptomatic die or become immune uh, with a probability of PM or 1 minus PM, uh, respectively. And asymptomatic persons become immune, well, at least they do with the flu, not so much with the corona. 
because the final transition uh, does not influence the spread of the disease. We use PM equals zero. All right, person-to-person -person transmission events are evaluated at the beginning of each period during which a person is infectious, assuming contact events are statistically independent. Why would you make that assumption? <laughs> would you make that assumption that contact events are statistically independent and you put that into your algorithm? That's nuts, but they did. A transmission time for each infectious person, person leaks within the contact network is chosen from an exponential distribution uh, with a mean of the link's contact frequency scaled by, and they got a whole formula there, uh, is an in, in, ineffectively, ineffectivity of the disease is the relative ineffectivity of the disease state is the susceptibility of the disease. <laughs> now, I know they designed this. I, I know they designed all of this uh, specifically for the flu, and it doesn't work for the flu. It's certainly not going to work for something like uh, corona because corona behaves quite differently um, uh, than, than, than what the, uh, the way the flu is, uh, the way the flu goes. Uh, you, you can see that. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> here's the, here's the uh, breaking, f scrolling on down, getting to the discussion portion here. Results for our stylized small town suggest that targeted distancing strategies can be designed to effectively mitigate the local progression of pandemic influenza without the use of vaccine or antiviral drugs. For an in, uh, for an in, in, <laughs> Infectivity, infectivity, not in effect, infectivity similar to that of the 1957-58 Asian influenza pandemic targeting children and teenagers, but not only by not only closing schools, but also by keeping these age classes at home was effective. However, given uncertainty of the in infectivity of the influenza strain, underlying social contact network or relative infectivity susceptibility of the young versus adults planning to implement strategies that also target adults and the work environment is prudent. Prudent. To mitigate a strain with infectivity similar to that of the 1918-1919 Spanish flu uh, pandemic, simulation suggests that all young and adults must be targeted. You must be targeted, regardless of the likelihood enhanced trans, uh, of enhanced transmission by the young. Uh, you will be targeted. For what? Social distancing. Right now, they're putting it out there as a Oh, this is a fine idea. This is a good way for you to protect yourself. And we'll do it in a targeted way to start. You know, they're closing the schools, various places. They're closing other public venues, uh, South by Southwest, uh, other places. The Irish government said today that there there will be no, no St. Patrick's Day parades. All kinds of people all around the world, uh, governments, Around the world, closing down various uh, public venues, and certain employers also doing this social distancing, closing, telling all their employees, well, not all their employees, just the just the white collar ones, to work from home. You blue collar people, you need to keep coming in because, well. <laughs> You know, you're easily replaceable. We don't need you. We can get some uh, some other schlub to do this when you die from being here and being infected in our plant. But we need you to be here to put our products together and do our shipping and receiving. But all the people that are up there in the office jobs, they can work from home. You little low-paid scumbags, you keep on coming in because we need our stuff built. <laughs> <laughs> Implementation of social distancing strategies is challenging. They likely must be imposed, imposed, uh, soak that word in, 
for the duration of the local epidemic and possibly until a strain-specific vaccine is developed and distributed. And what did they tell you? Uh, 18 months before that happens at least? If compliance with strategy is high over this period, an epidemic within a community can be averted. However, if neighboring communities do not use these interventions, infected neighbors will continue to introduce influenza and prolong the local epidemic, albeit at a depressed level more easily accommodated by health care systems or death care systems, as the case may be. <laughs> our our design approach explicitly implements disease host interaction disease host you could be both you could be the disease and the host of the disease you are part of the disease you are being treated according to this report which will be implemented soon it's already underway uh, you, you will be treated as a pathogen. You are a pathogen. And you must be controlled. <laughs> All right, well, I lost my spot. So, for, uh, say, uh, within the communities for the uh, spread of infectious disease requires focused research that combines socio sociology, public health, and epidemiology. Such networks will likely differ across, differ across cultures, between urban and rural communities, and with, with community size. With the aid of detailed demographic data, expert uh, elicit, elicitation of social scientists, oh, social scientists, don't y'all just love them, and community members, behavioral surveys, and possibly experiments, experiments. <laughs> a network could be constructed for any community of interest. Uh, I'll let you. There's there's a ton more in this article that I skipped over, but I'll let you read it if you don't mind going to a .gov website. Yeah, it's on the CDC.gov website there. But let me tell you, uh, social distancing. That's a term. That's a phrase. That that's coming your way and it's coming to you big time. Yes, indeedy. I, I personally love it, though. I mean, social distancing to me, I, I live uh, the, the hermit lifestyle. And I, I know there are some others, uh, here in the chat at least, that do as well. And I know plenty of you out there in the, in the, in the world, I guess, um, also tend to avoid folks. Uh, and, and, and I admire you for that. People tend to be problems. People tend to be... Uh, you know, I, I I just find it's better to socially distance myself. <laughs> All right. So this article came out just a few days ago, but but I, I brought it up here because it's on the, the social distancing dot uh, com website, statnews dot com website, um, and it's. To fight coronavirus spread, the United States may expand social distancing measures. Social distancing measures, but it comes at a cost. Canceling large public gatherings, asking students to stay at home from school, closing down borders. We ain't never closed the freaking borders yet. You think you can now? <laughs> anyway, many places around the world have already implemented such drastic steps in response to the new coronavirus outbreak that originated in China or originated in Canada and was shipped to China, but yeah, that's a whole other story, and has spread uh, to at least 27 territories. It's, I think it's uh, over, 100, over 100 countries now it's supposed to be in outside of China. Uh, if the United States, which has 11, uh, this was not that long ago, 11 cases, uh, I think the United States is, what, 500 cases now? Uh, anyway, 11 cases so far, begins to see sustained human-to-human -human transmission, health officials may also have to rapidly step up their own use of social distancing measures to prevent further spread. Just last week, the United States reported the first case of human-to-human -human transmission, 
where an Illinois woman in her Illinois, excuse me, woman in her 60s <laughs> who had traveled to Wuhan passed on the virus to her husband who had not traveled with her and late Sunday night officials in California reported another such case a 57 year old man recently returned from China and he and his wife who did not travel to China are now both sick with the virus public health officials were quick to point out that the threat to the United States still remains low is that the case today? I mean, what, six days later in this article? The virus, six days, right? This is, oh, this is February 3rd, not March 3rd. Okay, so a month and six days. <laughs> I know, things are happening fast, though. Boom, 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 boom. So this is that's February 3rd. Okay, uh, I, I don't know why I read that as March 3rd, but whatever. Um, public health officials were quick to point out that the threat to the United States still remains low. This virus is not spreading widely across the community at this time. Too bad, so sad. Uh, Dr. some name I can't pronounce, director of the Illinois Department of Public Health, told reporters last week, adding, we are not recommending people in the general public take additional precautions, such as canceling activities or avoiding going out of their homes. They are now. <laughs> they are now. <laughs> but officials there and elsewhere in the U.S. are already thinking ahead, yeah, a month ahead, uh, for when they may have to pull, put into place larger directives in communities uh, to stop the spread of the virus, especially as the nature of the outbreak, which has infected more than 17,000 people. Oh, it's well over 100,000 now. Um, and killed more than 360, and that's what, 4,000 plus? Is changing rapidly. So there you go, over tenfold in a month uh, on both of those numbers. Already, federal health officials took the rare step last week of quarantining all 195 American citizens Citizens evacuated from Wuhan, China, where the outbreak is believed to have originated. Well, that's where they started spreading it. Whether it originated there or not is, again, a question for a different time. Dr. Nancy Messonner, director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Disease, wow, uh, said the agency is preparing as if this is the next pandemic. Good on you. Hey, how about that? Yeah, you're getting that social distancing going, aren't you? <laughs> if we take strong measures now, too late, too bad, we may be able to blunt the impact of the virus on the U.S. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, late Friday, the federal government also created or declared a national public health emergency and issued a ban on foreign nationals traveling to the United States from China, oh, and several other nations. Now, other social distancing steps, social distancing steps uh, the United States has already began taking include airport screenings in 20 different cities, 20, I think we got more than 20 cities, and isolating six pa sick patients which the United States has employed on a smaller scale. Isolating someone who is sick is very standard practice, said Dr. Ashisha Da, a public health researcher at Harvard, uh, some kind of school of public health there. Anyway, just uh, bear in mind this here, because uh, they are, as I said, this, this is uh, just over a month ago, and the things have changed dramatically uh, in that time since that uh, since that article came out. Um, <laughs> yes, things have changed dramatically. The social distancing is coming your way, whether you agree to it or not, whether you voluntarily do it or not. Uh, there will be directives coming at you, and yeah, I, I, but I, I kind of look forward to seeing. And, and it, it's easy for somebody like me that lives in a, a little tiny town with not too many people in it. I could walk up and down the street all day and never bump into anybody. Uh, but you people that live in the cities where you got to uh, 
fight the crowds and go in there and deal with folk. Uh, how are you going to do it? How, how, I mean, if you want to continue uh, living a semi-normal life, you're not going to be able to uh, because <laughs> people are going to be avoiding you or trying to avoid you, and you're going to be trying to avoid them. It's, it's going to be uh, humorous from my perspective. Probably not yours if you're living in the city, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it's going to be fun to watch that, seeing people just uh, doing as much as they possibly can uh, to avoid each other. <laughs> but, the, but the reactions that, that we're seeing around the world uh, from, from this pandemic, should I put it that way, um, are, are nothing short of massively entertaining. However, even though that be the case, and you see people out there doing some of the crazy things they're doing, you have to take note of that because some of that, some of the, those crazy actions could come to affect you directly. For example, if you're used to going down to the grocery store and buying certain items at a regular time, you may not be able to get some because all the rest of the people in your community freaked out and went down there and, and just bought up everything, as this article says, which was posted today on ZeroHedge.com. Never seen anything like it. As virus cases surge, Americans are panic hoarding supplies. Panic hoarding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as confirmed U.S. cases soar above 500 this past weekend, Americans made a mad dash to Costco stores across the country to hoard food, water, and disinfectants. The Baltimore Sun reports that some Maryland shoppers spent most of the weekend panic buying supplies at big box retailers as six confirmed cases were reported in the area. The Sun interviewed shoppers across the Baltimore-Washington metropolitan area that loaded up on supplies amid pandemic fears. The BJ's, BJ's Wholesale Club. You can get whole, BJ's on wholesale? Wow. All right, BJ's Wholesale Club in Canton, uh, Harris Teeter in Canton, uh, crossing, uh, crossing the Whole Foods and Inner Arbor experienced uh, a surge in shoppers on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I'm always prepared, Denise Cox told the son at Harris Teeter in Canton Crossing Saturday morning. She spent the last several weeks buying water, Clorox wipes, uh, Lysol spray, and bleach. When I bought this bleach, Corona was in my thoughts. Did you buy any Corona? <laughs> and also, if you're always prepared, why are you panic buying? In Ruxton, Maryland, a wealthy suburb of Baltimore City, Growls Market reported a run by locals who wiped out their supply of sanitizer items, Clorox wipes, and canned products. I've never seen anything like it, said Assistant Manager Jeff Major, who has worked for the grocery store for nearly two decades. Major said the store purchased several cases of Purell hand sanitizer last Wednesday, and it was sold out by that evening. I think rubbing alcohol will be the next thing to go, General Manager Tom Gilbert said. Fingers crossed we'll have hand sanitizer by March 15th. Just don't touch anybody until then. Sandy Pierce spent her weekend driving around the Baltimore metropolitan area, going from store to store in search of disinfectants such as Lysol and Clorox. Pierce went, went to nine stores on Saturday, telling the Sun that disinfectants were all sold out everywhere. However, she hit the jackpot at Walgreens on York Road, uh, where she found a 12-ounce can of Lysol spray for $8, marked up well over 100%. Walgreens gouging, doubling the price of their Lysol spray. 
She said Amazon was all sold out of disinfectants, which forced her to spend the weekend searching for virus prevention products at brick-and-mortar stores. Amazon is not sold out in disinfectants. I don't know what you were looking for up there, lady, but they're all over the place, and they're at reasonable prices. Anyway, the last time I saw this was the last big snowstorm, Pierce said, before it was bred. Now it's germ virus killers. <laughs> Rod Hall, store manager at Dollar General in Baltimore uh, City, said someone walked into his store and bought hundreds of dollars of disinfectants last week. It was Clorox. It was Lysol. It was the store brand. He didn't care. Hall said he explained the man wiped the store shelves clean. I'm pretty sure it was for business. He said his store is out of hand sanitizer, rubbing alcohol, and surgical masks. Anyway, it goes on and on. <laughs> they have a map here showing the uh, virus hot spots um, a, a, around the country. And you, you can guess where it is. It's New York. It's uh, King County, Washington. It's Santa Clara, California. It's Los Angeles. It's, you know, these, these places that are dirty anyway. President Trump is well aware of the situation and panic across America. Trump said Monday that nothing is shut down. Wrong. Life in the economy go on. Uh, wrong! <laughs> Trump administration is absolutely terrified that they cannot control the narrative of the greatest economy ever as virus surges, cases surge across the country. Oh, this is also highly amusing. Entertaining. Uh, just delightful to see. Just delightful to see. <laughs> because anything that keeps people away from you is, is a bonus, in my view. Now, I know I have to go from my house to, like, the the, uh, the post office to pick up my mail on occasion. Eh, once a week, something like that, whatever. I don't have to pick it up too often. I've got an oversized box. But when I do that, should I be, like, all wrapped up in plastic and, and sprayed down with anti-whatevers? No. No, I'm just going to walk in there, open my box, get my stuff, and leave. Um, I go there, always have gone there anyway, after hours, so eh, there's not the crowd of people in there. It's not like there's ever really a crowd of people in there, but uh, sometimes there's four or five people in there if you go there during uh, peak business hours. <laughs> Uh, but one of the funnest things, one of, one of the funnest parts of all this going on, and I and I say that, well, because I mean it, because I I really have been waiting for this for a long time. Now, how far it'll go, I don't know, but we saw it today, we we saw it today, two thousand two thousand point drop on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, two thousand. Plus, 2020 or something like that. Right, right around there. Anyway, last week, there was plenty of days down by several percentage points, two, three percentage points. Today was the biggest one. Ah, oh, yeah, by far the biggest one. And this article is called Black Monday Part 2. Part 2. <laughs> the return of Black Monday. At its lows today, this was the market's biggest down day since 1987. By the close, the biggest since 2018. Uh, I'm not sure where. where anyway, uh, In reflection of the total loss of faith by policymakers among by-the-fucking-dippers, <laughs> sentiment trader notes that this is the only day in the history of the S&P 500 futures that they gapped down more than negative 5% and didn't close above the open. Did the 11-year-long, almost unstoppable bull run that started on March 9th, 2009, 11 years ago, just end on March 9th, 2020, 11 years to the day? <laughs> Here's another stat for the record books. 
Total U.S. trading volume on a 10-day moving average basis is now higher than during the meltdown in 2008. Volume is another whopper at over 17 billion shares. Thanks to the market perceiving President Trump's response as remaining to be one of denial. I just thought it was delusion. Maybe it's denial. I think he is delusional, but... Maybe it's denial of the scale of the problem and concerns that fiscal stimulus will be underwhelming. Things are already anxious as markets open Sunday night, but the situation was worsened considerably as both Russia and Saudi Arabia stood poised to flood the market with cheap crude oil uh, in an all in all out price war just as the coronavirus is spurring the first contraction in demand since 2009. The situation we are witnessing today seems to have no equal in the oil market, according to Fate Fatabaral, a combination of massive supply overhang and a significant demand shock at this same time. Oil futures fell by about one-third in New York and London on Monday, the biggest drop since the Gulf War of 1991, before pulling back to a 20% decline. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, this, this is it's, it's, it's amazing and interesting and fun to watch. See, the thing is, since, since China, not, not in totality, but a lot, of what the stuff, you know, mo most of the stuff for American manufacturing, and I put American manufacturing in air quotes there, uh, because it's more, it's American assembly. We, we don't really do manufacturing here. Um, <laughs> but all those parts come from China. And a lot of the supply lines, a lot of the companies that ship those various parts are are not shipping. They're not allowed to ship. Uh, they're being prevented from shipping. So the supply lines for the manufacturing processes are cut off. So what is going to, until those, those things are opened back up and people, uh, companies or corporations are allowed to once again start getting whatever it is they need from China, this is going to be a problem. It, it, <laughs> Oh boy, uh, that's terrific! <laughs> Kate just po Kate just posted a link there in the chat. Tampa strip club offers face masks to customers to fight the spread of coronavirus. Yeah, <laughs> that's terrific. Uh, anyway, so what's going to turn this around? I, I really don't know. Um, if there's anything that's really going to turn it around, but what what is really going on though? Where where, where? I mean. Is this is this a thing or is it not a thing? I don't know. On the website Moon of Alabama posted on February 8, 2020, so a month ago, this article came out. The epidemic recedes. Number of new coronaviruses uh, in decline. A month ago, number of new coronaviruses in decline. Well, I guess he was wrong. <laughs> According to the guy, though, I don't see a name on here. He didn't. He didn't, he didn't post a name, or did he? No, he didn't. All right, no name. All right. Anyway, uh, the novel coronavirus (NCOV19) epidemic is a receding danger, but its effects will stay with us for some time. In general, uh, from the Cakesin report, C-A-I-X-I-N report, um, in general, with the increase in isolation, social distancing, and treatment work, the number of new suspected cases nationwide has decreased, and the number of new confirmed cases outside of Hubei has fallen for four consecutive days. The situation of the new coronavirus epidemic situation may have improved, on the 7th, the, the first confirmed case appeared in only one city, and the number of newly cured, cured cases, let me put cured in air quotes as well, 
uh, cured cases exceeded the number of new deaths for nine consecutive days, indicating that the epidemic was under control. Now, again, <laughs> how, 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 how true was that? I'm going to have to say, not very. <laughs> the next day after that, February 9th, the next day after that, <laughs> came this article posted on ZeroHedge.com. The death rate is up to 5%. The harrowing admission of a Wuhan doctor, frontline coronavirus doctor, who I think is dead now, uh, tells of life and death in the ICU. In the coronavirus epidemic, doctors on the front lines take on the greatest risk and best understand the situation. Dr. Pen Ziong, director of acute medicine in the Wuhan University South Central Hospital, is one of those doctors. In an interview on Tuesday with Cakes and Dr. Peng, described his personal experiences in first encountering the disease in early January and quickly grasping its virulent potential and the need for stringent quarantine measures. As the contagion spread and flooded his ICU, the doctor observed three patients, uh, observed that three weeks seemed to determine the difference between life and death. Patients with stronger immune systems would start to recover in a couple of weeks, but in the second week, some cases would turn for the worse. In the third week, keeping some of those acute patients alive might require extraordinary intervention. For this group, the death rate seems to be 4% to 5%, Dr. Peng said. Uh, after working his 12-hour daytime shifts, he, the doctor spends his evening researching the disease and has summarized his observations in a thesis. The doctors and nurses in his hospital are overwhelmed with patients. Once they don protective hazmat suits, they go without food, drink, and bathroom breaks for their entire shift. That's because there aren't enough of the suits for a mid-shift change, he said. <laughs> This is a month ago. This is a month ago. Um, <laughs> so if if it was five percent, and I because they're reporting it's around that now, uh, it's bounced around from two to five percent, but uh, it, it, it's all kind of uh, amazing uh, of, of what this is. Is this something or isn't it? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Well, what matters, what, what really matters is the reactions from the people out there, from the, the, from the governments, from the regular folk on the street, from the people on, the, on your social media sites, uh, j just everywhere is reactions uh, from, the, from the people freaking out uh, and, and panic buying all this stuff, the stock markets, just taking these massive dives. Uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, to to the companies shutting down uh, events and co uh, company, their companies sending their people to work from home, uh, schools shutting down, keeping all the kids out. Uh, kids aren't even getting sick. Uh, they may be carrying the disease, but they're not getting sick from it. Uh, just, just so many various different things, th these reactions to people. And if it gets, if the reactions get worse, I don't know about whether the anything will actually happen uh, from from this disease, although it spreads very easily. Um, uh, it, it, it's it's not at this point harming a lot of folks, at least not harming a lot of folks under the age of sixty. Uh, you may get sick for a while and then you get better. Um, <laughs> Anyway, just watching all this is is, is uh, something to behold. Uh, the true nature of humans, in uh, in the way they are, they uh, humans are. Uh, I'm not sure who said it. Might have been Carlin. Uh, humans are panicky in groups. Humans as a group, they're panicky. Individuals 
normally you can deal with on a pretty rational basis. Normally. Uh, of course, we've known uh, plenty, and, uh, each of us, have known people that are not. You cannot deal with on a rational basis. They they are just freaked the fuck out. And <laughs> so, uh, I'll, you know, I'll keep watching this. I know this is kind of a different uh, Leftovers show than I normally do. But, uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> We're going to give you something else here. Um, I'm totally not on this. Uh, yeah, very easily. <laughs> Vincified. Something totally not on the having anything to do with Corona, uh, but having to do with people just being stupid. Um, and that is from California. It says, in, this is on Reason.com, by the way, posted on uh, February 5th. In California, protecting workers means outlawing their jobs. Assembly Bill 5 was designed to constrain the growth of the so-called gig economy. In practice, it's closing off opportunities. Now, I say this has nothing to do with the coronavirus. Although, from stuff I've read today and over recent days, it does actually have something to do with corona. <laughs> I'll get to that in a minute. As a freelancer, I have the flexibility to do work while I'm at school or do work late at night or, you know, uh, not that work week stuff because I'm busy. A journalist or a graduate student at Pepperdine University told Reason in late 2019, on January 1st, 2020, earning extra cash got a lot more difficult. California Assembly Bill 5 was designed to constrain the growth of so-called gig economy based upon the theory that companies like Uber, Lyft, and Postmates are taking advantage of contract labor. I am unfamiliar with Postmates. Uh, sounds like something to do with the mail. Maybe they deliver your mail for you. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> however, today I did... I. I, I I did read that um, Uber and Lyft are both now going to supply, uh, provide to their contractors, their independent contractors, pay if they are told not to work over the coronavirus, meaning that it's coming, that they're going to be told not to work because of the coronavirus. So they're somehow going to pay their drivers, their independent contractor drivers, which deserve no sick pay of any kind, but they're going to go ahead and pay them because they've kind of been pressured into it. Uh, any of these companies that are hiring you as an independent contractor, um, uh, you get nothing. I, that's it. You're an independent contractor. You you supply all your own stuff. Dozens of professions, including many jobs in healthcare, commercial fishing, grant writing, hairstyling, and fine arts are exempt from the law. Journalists were allotted a partial exemption of 35 submissions per year per client. Um, anyway, so this new law in California is really going to screw over these people that are trying to live in a gig economy um, by, by doing gig work. Because a lot of these companies are just going to say, well, shit, if we got to pay you, you're no longer you're no longer contracting for us. You just just get the hell out. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't need you. I mean, if we're going to start hiring people to be drivers, first off, you're going to make less per per drive, and uh, because uh, we got to pay you know for benefits, you, you ain't getting that kind of money anymore. Uh, and uh, mostly, also, it'll be we don't need you. We'll get our the people that we hire to work more at a regular on a regular schedule. All right. Well, that, that's that for that. Um, <laughs> thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, like I said, I know it's a different kind of leftovers show today, but uh, but I had to talk about the social distancing. I I, I think it's a uh, an important thing for everybody to realize what's coming up the pike here really quick. Social distancing. Uh, by, by fiat. They're, they're going to shove it down your throat. They are going to force people into social distancing, uh, whether that be by edict or, or by uh, trying to, you know, if, they, if you see somebody out on the street, 
you know, looking out your window, you can shame them in some manner. Uh, I don't know how they're going to do it, but it's coming, and it's coming pretty soon. Uh, and hooray for that. <laughs> All right. It's just, thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'll be back next week with another episode of Grandma Leftovers. With any luck, unless I get virus stricken. Um, all right. Tomorrow at um, 2 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, will we'll be will be the uh, In a Perfect World show. It's normally 3 p.m. Eastern. However, uh, over there where, where Flash lives, they haven't changed the time yet. To for so for him to stay on his normal schedule, we'll adjust our side of the, the pond schedule, and we'll do it an hour early. Yeah, gotta keep him separated. <laughs> so he'll be on at two p.m. tomorrow, and uh, we'll, we'll see what uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of what happens there. Check the schedule on reallibertybd.com for all the rest of the shows throughout the week, and you all have, all have yourself a great week. Stay away from people! <laughs> Peace!